Who rose and who froze in the second GOP debate? The top tier is trying to capitalize while others are trying to make it to next month's debate stage. This is Special Report. Good evening, welcome to Washington. I'm Brett Baer. The GOP presidential candidates are back on the campaign trail today after battling out it out on stage during last night's second primetime debate. Chief political correspondent Carl Cameron tonight from Las Vegas with how the candidates who went toe to toe with frontrunner Donald Trump are trying to capitalize on that today. The day after the second debate was about cleanup and crowing. Carly Fiorina stole the show with specific answers and stiff arming Donald Trump. I hope a lot of American people learned a little bit more about me last night, who I am, what I believe, what I would do. With good reason, she outdueled the Donald. And you were forced to file for bankruptcy not once, I never not for twice, bankruptcy. four times, a record four times. Why should we trust you Mr. to manage you the finances of this nation? Asked about Trump's remarks degrading her face. The only female in the GOP race, Lusta Haymaker. I think women all over this country heard very clearly what Mr. Trump said. I think she's got a beautiful face, and I think she's a beautiful woman. Jeb Bush sparred most with Trump, who got the most airtime, but still complained about the format this morning. The biggest problem I had was three hours is too long. Bush's high point came when Trump criticized his brother's foreign policy. Your brother and your brother's administration gave us Barack Obama because it was such a disaster those last three months that Abraham Lincoln couldn't have been elected. You know what? As it relates to my brother, there's one thing I know for sure. He kept us safe. I don't know if you remember. Bush had no complaints this morning. It went great. I was aggressive like I always am. Second in the polls, Ben Carson refused to trade insults with his rivals and revealed one of the biggest donor lists in the race. We now have over 500,000 donations and the money is coming in. For others, Trump trashing is a staple. I think really there's a sophomore quality that is entertaining about Mr. Trump. By contrast, Marco Rubio had a strong night, showcasing his empathetic personal stories and sophisticated policy answers. Here's what you're going to see in the next few weeks. The Russians will begin to fly, fly combat missions in that region, not just targeting ISIS, but in order to prop up Assad. He will also then turn to other countries in the region and say, America is no longer a reliable ally, Egypt. America is no longer a reliable ally, Saudi Arabia. Begin to rely on us. Scott Walker needed a breakout moment, but got the least time of anyone. I may be an entertainer because I've had tremendous success with number one bestsellers all over the place, with The Apprentice and everything else I've done. He came out swinging with the little time he had. And Mr. Trump, we don't need an apprentice in the White House. Mike Huckabee and Ted Cruz made impassioned cases to defund Planned Parenthood and defend religious freedom. John Kasich and Chris Christie had similar rejoinders for the bickering. For the 55-year-old construction worker out in that audience tonight who doesn't have a job, who can't fund his child's education, I got to tell you the truth, they could care less about your careers. They care about theirs. For the first time in months, it's not Trump, but Fiorina dominating the news. And that drives polls and donations. And Fiorina has a fundraiser this evening in California. Donald Trump is in New Hampshire. And tonight, Jeb Bush, who had a fundraiser himself this morning early in California, has a meeting here at a community center in Nevada, the home of the first Western Conference Caucus next year, Brett. Carl Cameron in Nevada tonight. Carl, thank you. So who do you think? Were the winners, the losers from last night's debate, and why? Let me know at Facebook.com slash SR or on Twitter at Brett Bear. You can use the hashtag special report. Send us something good. We may use it later in our special Throwback Thursday panel. No hike for now. The Federal Reserve decided today to leave interest rates unchanged. The vote at the Fed 9 to 1 not to raise the rates. Reaction was mixed today on Wall Street. The Dow closed down 65 points. The S&P 500 was down 5. The Nasdaq closed in the green nearly 5 points up. So the question becomes, why is this Fed decision such a big deal? What does it tell us about the state of the U.S. economy? Trish Regan, host of the Intelligence Report on the Fox Business Network, joins us now from New York with some answers. So Trish, why should voters, viewers care about today's decision? Brett, because it tells us we're in bad shape. I mean, the economy is not in a good spot here at home. Globally, 
things are in a really tough spot. And this is what Janet Yellen and company recognized here today when they said, we're not going to move. We're not going to move even just a quarter of a point to raise rates. And you know, this is a fad, Brett, that doesn't want to be on zero. They shouldn't be on zero. We've been on zero for six plus years. So you know what that means? If, you, if you've got a CD at your local bank, you're earning nothing right now. Nothing on that. So you're being forced into riskier assets, into, uh, you know, I, I, I've said Puerto Rican bonds, but you know, maybe that, that's a good kind of analogy and example. It's putting everyday investors and the entire investing community into riskier products. So the Fed doesn't like being here, but I'll tell you, they feel like they don't have a choice. And that's why people are a little nervous right now. Yeah, but this market though, Trish, is addicted to the Fed. And, and the question is, will it be volatile reaction kind of going forward with this decision today? You're absolutely right. It is addicted to the Fed, and you can expect more volatility because we got another meeting coming up in October, and we got another meeting coming up in December. So basically, between each of these meetings, people are going to be on standby saying, what is the Fed going to do next? And if they were to take away the punch bowl, can the market survive? That's the big question. All right, last thing quickly. I mean, for people at home, it just means the economy is a little iffy? Well, you know, the economy is not in a good spot. It is if you know, 5.1%, the administration likes to tout that unemployment rate. I'll tell you, Brett, 5.1% just ain't what it used to be because you've got a lot of Americans now that have just ducked out of the labor force altogether. We are at the highest rate of labor participation, lack of labor participation right now since the 1970s. So people aren't earning much and they're not participating in the workforce. None of that is good. All right, Trish, as always, thank you. Make sure to check out a special edition of Intelligence Report with Trish Regan tonight, 8 p.m. Eastern Time on the Fox Business Network. General Motors will pay nearly $1.5 billion to settle cases related to faulty ignition switches. The motor vehicle company will forfeit $900 million as part of a settlement with the U.S. government. The company also announced it will pay nearly $600 million to settle civil lawsuits. GM has been blamed for concealing the faulty switches that are to blame for hundreds of deaths and injuries. The head of the Environmental Protection Agency, the EPA, was grilled today over her agency's response, or lack of it, for failing to notify residents of a toxic chemical spill in the Animas River last month. Sir, I have indicated that our notifications could have been better, but the, the, uh, the Navajo was given No, you didn't. In your testimony, after. you said you're working closely with we them. You didn't say you screwed up on the communication. I didn't, Why would it I take just two didn't days? I didn't say that either, sir. I said that we did take a day. I regret that. I wish it had been earlier. The EPA has vowed to commit all necessary resources toward cleaning up that spill. More than 3 million gallons of contaminated water that contain various metals and harmful chemicals such as arsenic and lead. Amid growing concerns over the reasons and why Russia's military buildup in Syria is happening, senior Obama administration officials said today they plan to accept an invitation to talk directly with the Russians about their actions in Syria. Correspondent Kevin Corks at the White House tonight with the latest. For a White House that's been reluctant to wade into conflict in the Middle East, the prospect of sharing a war zone in Syria with Russian forces is rife with potential problems. We've made clear that uh, Russia's military actions uh, inside of Syria, uh, if they are used to prop up the Assad regime, uh, would be destabilizing and counterproductive. Counterproductive, say White House officials, to prop up the regime behind much of the carnage in the Syrian civil war, which has already cost more than a quarter million people their lives and displaced 11 million others, a figure that includes some four million refugees, tens of thousands of whom are trekking toward Europe. The Russians, they want to fight ISIS, but they want to keep Assad in place because he's their bad guy. And uh, he sees, or they see him as a benefit to the region, not a liability. Which further complicates the fighting in Syria, because both the United States and Russia say they're fighting ISIS. But while Moscow is arming Damascus, Washington is looking to end the brutal Assad regime. A sluggish effort, embarrassed by the recent revelations that despite spending more than $40 million so far to train Syrian fighters, fewer than a half dozen are ready to go into battle. I spoke to Foreign Minister Lavrov again yesterday, the third time in less than a week. 
I made clear that Russia's continued support for Assad risks escalating the conflict. Secretary of State John Kerry's plea underscores the heightened tensions between the superpowers and comes as Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu prepares to visit Russia, even as the White House proudly announced its own BB visit with President Obama in November, their first face-to-face -face since the Iran nuclear deal survived a fight on Capitol Hill. And one more quick nugget for you here tonight, Brett. White House officials say in terms of engaging the Russian military in conversation, that's fine, so long as the talks are tactical practical conversations, but it should be also pointed out that the military here and there haven't had any dialogue since the Russians invaded Crimea back in 2014. Brett? Kevin Cork live on the North Lawn. Kevin, thank you. Up next, Hillary Clinton takes aim at dwindling poll numbers. First, here's what some of our Fox affiliates around the country are covering tonight. Fox 4 in Dallas, where American Airlines flights are back in the air after a computer outage grounded planes to and from Dallas, Chicago, and Miami for about two hours today due to a technical failure. Fox 29 in San Antonio, where the Army sergeant charged with desertion after walking off his base in Afghanistan before being captured by the Taliban, was in court today. Bo Bergdahl sat quietly taking notes as testimony got underway to decide whether he should face a military trial where he possibly faces court-martial. This is a live look from our affiliate in New York, Fox 5. One story there tonight, a 22-year-old Queens man appeared in court today on charges he was trying to join ISIS. Court documents show Ali Saleh tried and failed multiple times to fly abroad to join the terror group. The FBI says one attempt was even thwarted after his parents took away his passport. That's tonight's live look outside the Beltway from Special Report. We'll be right back.